Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this extraordinary session of Athens Democracy Forum, which also serves as a grand finale for what has been a thought-provoking three days of debate and deliberation. I'm sure you will all remember that line from Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Well, here it is. Our next conversation is between the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, and an Israeli intellectual, Yuval Noah Harari, who doesn't even have a smartphone and has declared <laughs> that Homo sapiens, as we know them, will disappear in a century or so. That prediction may have seemed a bit hyperbolic a few months ago, but as we meet virtually and talk through face masks in the midst of the pandemic crisis, we have to take it more seriously. But while we're still here, let me welcome our speakers. Mr. Mitsotakis has been Prime Minister since July 2019, which has given him time to confront a Herculean set of crises from the pandemic to the new tensions with Turkey. Mr. Harari is a bit harder to define. I guess he is what these days we call a public intellectual whose ideas generate excitement, controversy, and debate, a bit like Socrates. I trust we'll get a bit of that here. Liz Alderman, our chief business correspondent for the New York Times, is here to keep things in check. So here's to politics, power, and the pandemic. Will this have traces of some Herculean and Socratian approaches? Liz, over to you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Achilles, and we're really pleased to welcome the both of you here today. I suppose it is appropriate to call this sort of, you know, a dialogue between Hercules and Socrates. We do have brains and intellectual brawn here, that's for sure. Um, let me dive straight in. I do want this to be a, a conversation that is an unplugged conversation between the two of you, um, Socrates style. Um, so I'm going to sort of sit in the background a little bit as the chorus um, and jump in from time to time to referee and maybe throw you all a few questions uh, to steer the conversation in, in different directions. But you've all, obviously, you have been thinking a great deal um, about how the world will be different once we're through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Prime Minister, you have been very busy um, trying to, you know, managing uh, an entire country, steering a country through the pandemic, um, very successfully making Greece uh, in many ways a kind of a model um, for, for the world. And that uh, has obviously uh, involved striking a delicate balance in, in governance. So let me kick off your conversation, if I may, um, with something that you've all recently put out there. You wrote recently that in times of crisis, we face two choices citizen empowerment and totalitarian surveillance, and nationalist isolation or global solidarity. For the both of you, where, do you, where, where is the world coming down on, the, on, on, the, on that divide right now? You all, do you want to take that? And oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it, it's, it's a bit too early to say. I mean, we are still in the midst of the crisis, and we probably haven't seen the worst, not in terms of the pandemic itself, and certainly not in terms of the economic and political fallout. The big battle is not between humanity and the virus. The big battle is between us and our own inner demons. And as you said, we are facing a choice. We can react to the crisis uh, by going the way of authoritarianism and totalitarianism, trying to fight the pandemic by imposing a totalitarian regime from above or by uh, empowering the citizens. And similarly, we can react to the crisis by generating hatred and competition between countries, uh, blaming the crisis on foreigners and minorities, or we can try to cooperate. Uh, now, for me, it's, it's obvious what is the right thing to do, but as a historian, I know that we should never underestimate human stupidity. It's one of the most powerful forces in, in history. And in many cases, you know, like the, the, the choice should be obvious, but people still do the other thing. And my greatest fear is that when people look back in 40 years, 50 years at the COVID crisis, they will not remember the masks. They will not remember uh, the virus. They will remember this was the time when surveillance really took over, this was the time 
when democracy failed and authoritarian regimes took over. It's not inevitable, it's still in our power to prevent this from happening, um, but that's, that, that's the main fear. And you know, we are here looking at the birthplace of uh, democracy in Athens on the Acropolis, and you know, democracy is very, very fragile. It's like a delicate flower that needs unique conditions to survive, whereas dictatorships are like weeds. They can grow almost everywhere. Um, here, the democratic experiment that began 2,500 years ago, it lasted only 200 years and then collapsed. And for more than 2,000 years, this place was ruled by foreign empires and dictatorships, took a very difficult road to rebuild democracy. And I hope that we are not losing it again. Is that a legitimate concern in your view? I Prime think Minister? it is a legitimate uh, concern, although uh, I, I would argue that uh, we, we have enough evidence that in terms of the two dilemmas that you uh, highlighted, at least the Western world, Why do I say that? Uh, as far as the Greek quote-unquote experiment uh, is, uh, is, is concerned, we wouldn't have been successful uh, in, uh, in fighting the, uh, the first wave uh, of the pandemic had we not been able to engage uh, citizens proactively uh, and build a relationship of trust uh, between government, and by government I mean the state, not necessarily the elected government, uh, and citizens. It was not easy because we came out of 10 years of crisis when all our institutions were, uh, were challenged, but we, we did manage to create uh, a sense of, um, uh, of collective destiny, which, however, uh, also assumed uh, changes in individual behavior, which is always, as you know, uh, quite tricky um, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to deliver. And it can never be totally imposed. And we did use technology, but I think we did it in a creative way. Because when we ask citizens, for example, to send out an SMS um, uh, as to whether they actually plan to leave their house, you can, a you can argue that this was the imposition of uh, the sort of a surveillance state. But we deleted all the data and we made it very, very clear that it was uh, a, a mechanism of collective empowerment rather than us having access to citizen data and monitoring them um, where they, uh, wherever they are. And, and we know that when it comes to, to behavior, you can't have a policeman next to, uh, next to everyone checking whether they wear or, or whether they don't wear uh, a mask. So changes in individual behavior are critical. But in order for us to achieve them, um, first of all, the choices cannot be political. So wearing a mask is not a political statement. It's an act of uh, self-defense, but also uh, an act of solidarity because you protect uh, uh, other people, especially your family, mm. because we know that most of the transmission is taking place within the household. So uh, it's an act to protect the, those who, um, uh, who, you, uh, who you love um, the most. So I'm a big believer that we can actually use um, uh, data in a public, in an open way, uh, to help us drive educated decision making. Now, as far as the second point, um, um, let's say nativism, uh, hatred versus global cooperation, uh, I would argue that in, in, in spite of you know, all, all the noise and everything that has, uh, that has happened, the fact that we're able to develop a vaccine in months or even, let's say, 18 months rather than, than 10 years is an unprecedented success yes. uh, of global cooperation. And the European Union, um, as a collective entity that rises above the level of the nation state, has been able to cooperate when it comes to vaccines. So there is no doubt how the vaccines will be distributed. Uh, it's not going to be, it's going to be per capita. The European Union is purchasing vaccines and then distributing them uh, to rich nations, poor nations, um, uh, uh, regardless, uh, with, with using the same basic algorithm depending on the, uh, on the population. And then it's also putting out general guidelines as to how people will be vaccinated. So I'd say that this is a, is a positive example um, of, of global cooperation, but of course we need more. We had a very interesting discussion yesterday at the Council, how we can facilitate travel, how mm -hmm. we can have unified rules, how, how we can uh, make sure we have same guidelines or same yardsticks. So as far as the West is concerned, because the East, that's a different uh, um, uh, 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 question, as far as the Western democracy is concerned, I think we can draw some positive 
um, uh, mm. conclusions as to how some countries at least have managed this. But I think you're leaving out maybe the most important part of the West, which is the United States. Uh, the EU has indeed been reacting, at least in recent months, in a much more cooperative way. But the United States, which was traditionally for decades uh, the leader of the free world and the leader of the West, is no longer leading anybody, hardly leading even itself. Um, whereas in previous crisis, the US was at the front, whether it's the 2008 financial crisis or the Ebola epidemic. Um, now it's nowhere to be seen in terms of global cooperation. Actually, the US administration has even abandoned uh, the US itself, basically the central government telling states and, and mayors and municipalities, you deal with it yourself. And what is the future uh, that you see for the Western world in this crisis and in future worse crises to come, global warming, the rise of AI, if the United States is really abdicating yeah. its job as leader? Uh, I think you raise a fair point, although I don't think that in the medium or in the long term uh, this is going to happen because I simply believe that uh, what we call, what we used to call for 70 years, the transatlantic alliance is simply too strong um, to, um, uh, to be um, uh, destroyed as far as its foundation is, uh, is concerned. And uh, when it comes to this level of, of, uh, uh, of, of leadership, uh, I think that it is, uh, it also places a burden on us Europeans mm -hmm. to make sure that we get our act together uh, and that we do take decisions at the European level which will exercise our collective power. We are probably the, the largest economic, uh, collectively the largest economic power in the world. As far as data protection is concerned, we are at the forefront uh, mm -hmm. of establishing what I think is an appropriate balance between uh, making sure that we don't put a, you know, a, a, a block uh, or a constraint on technological progress while at the same time um, protecting uh, data privacy. And of course, this is constantly going to evolve because we're just scratching the surface uh, of the challenges that we will face. And when, when it was necessary, uh, two months ago, we delivered a big package of economic um, support to, to member states, which went way beyond what many people expected the European Union could do. But uh, I, I do think that there's going to be a new chapter uh, as far as our relationship with the U.S. Um, is, uh, uh, is concerned, which is uh, uh, not necessarily related to the outcome of the election. And let me wish you know, President Trump and his wife uh, you know, all the best in, you know, in, uh, in, in fighting this, uh, um, uh, this, this virus. And if, if there's one, one point which I would take out of this you know, sad story is that in that sense, the virus is very democratic. It doesn't make any exceptions. It can affect all of us. Um, from the most powerful person in the world mm. to um, um, people who would consider themselves um, uh, uh, underprivileged. So uh, uh, let's see how this thing is, is going gonna, is gonna to play out. But I wouldn't write off um, uh, you know, 70 years of institutional um, uh, building completely because the U.S. over the past years has followed a slightly different let approach. Me, let me steer you both, if I can, to a point that the both of you just brought up in that conversation, the economy. Um, and and uh, the the impact of the pandemic. I mean, this is obviously a huge sort of turning point in you know human history in many ways. Um, you mentioned, Prime Minister, obviously the the the, uh, the the social and economic support that European countries and indeed other countries in the world are bringing to their economies to their citizens. Um, but at the same time, what would you say is the lesson that we have learned so far about the trade-off between trying to keep uh, economies open and, and really from, because the more they're closed, the more they are devastated and jobs lost, and the trade-off between trying to maintain public health. We're looking at possibly a huge wave of you know, mass unemployment that could be with us for a long time. You know, how, how, how are we going to manage this, this challenge? Well, when the first wave hit, when we didn't know much about the virus, the choice was very clear we had to lock down. And we took the decision very, very early. And it was clearly the right decision because we managed to crush uh, the virus during its first wave. But uh, we knew that we had to take that decision at that time because we needed time to learn more about the virus and also strengthen our healthcare system. But we also knew that this would have a devastating economic um, uh, impact 
although I must say that in a globalized world, um, even countries that didn't do a full lockdown, such as Sweden, ended up paying the economic um, um, uh, price. But I think there's a general uh, agreement amongst at least European countries that it is very difficult, almost inconceivable, to go to a second full lockdown. Uh, and we're much smarter now, so we can do localized um, um, uh, lockdowns. Um, we, we use contact tracing in a much smarter way. We're, we do much more testing. Uh, we can be much more effective in contact tracing. But, but there is still a big question mark. And the question mark is, can we manage to live with the virus while maintaining economic normality without a full lockdown and without push, putting you know, too much strain on our healthcare system? I think no one has the answer yet because we still have three or four very difficult months. So we hope um, uh, and we're very optimistic that we won't need um, uh, uh, to take drastic measures along the lines of what we, what we did. But can anyone tell you with, uh, uh, with certainty? Um, uh, the answer is, is clearly no. And as far as economic support is concerned, uh, I think that um, uh, even we in Greece um, uh, supported the income of practically everyone, including the private sector. This is essentially the welfare state on steroids, what we did. And we, we actually um, uh, uh, made it very clear that we need to spend money to support um, the weaker members, um, uh, uh, the, uh, those who, who will be hit uh, uh, the hardest, low-paying jobs, uh, um, jobs in the hospitality sector, which was hit very hard. Um, uh, during uh, the summer because of because of tourism and we can still we can afford to do it um, we will afford to, we were able to do it for some time but obviously we cannot do it forever so um, uh, we are very concerned with uh, and we watch very carefully the numbers as we enter into the the fall and the winter we're lucky in Greece we can still be outdoors for quite some time uh, um, uh, but then you look at countries such as Israel, for example, that did extremely well during the first wave and are facing a big crisis now, and you understand how unpredictable uh, these things uh, are. And sometimes there, also, there, there is also an element of randomness, as you will recognize in some of these uh, events. You can have two or three super spreader events, and they can make all the difference. Yeah, I think that the two main points about the economic crisis, and especially also unemployment, uh, is the issue of automation and the issue of the global perspective, of the global safety net. Uh, first of all, we are seeing an uh, enormous rise in unemployment because of the pandemic. And at the same time, I mean, you could have expected, OK, there'll be a period of large unemployment. Gradually, within a few years, things will return to normal and people will have jobs again. But this, is th this time, it's different because at the same moment, you also have a dramatic historical shift in the economy, which is digitalization and automation. So entire industries are being digitalized and automated, something that experts thought would take 10, 20 years and we'll have a problem in 2040. It's now accelerating that, you know, in my own university, we talked about moving online, digitalizing the university for years and have done nothing. When the COVID strike um, we did it in two weeks, just shifted the whole university online. Now, automation means that a lot of the people who lose their jobs will not have any job to return to because the industry has changed or moved. And then the big question is retraining. There will be new jobs. The big problem is how to retrain people that before the crisis, had one kind of job, I don't know, a taxi driver or a truck driver, to do something completely different. Now, rich countries, whether Germany or Japan or the US, they have the resources to actually massively retrain the workforce. But what would poorer countries do? If they can't retrain their workforce, they are facing not just unemployment like we knew in, 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 in the past, they're facing the emergence of a useless class, a class of people which they, not just they don't have jobs, they don't have skills that are needed by the economy. And the other related problem is the global dimension. Again, conceivably, you can imagine that let's say the EU would come to help its weakest members and have an EU program to retrain the workforce uh, even in the poorer members. But then what happens in the Middle East? What happens in Africa? What happens in South America? 
um, entire countries might collapse and the resulting chaos and violence and waves of immigration will destabilize the entire world. Now Greece, which is on the front line of the immigration crisis in the Mediterranean, obviously needs to think not about only what happens to Greece and to Italy and to Spain, also what happens to Egypt, what happens to Turkey, what happens to African countries. And economically, my biggest concern is that so far there is absolutely no economic plan for the world. I mean, we are facing a global crisis, but we have only national or regional plans. We should have had a global economic plan months ago, but there is nothing of the sort. And the feeling is that on the global level, there are just no adults in the room. Everybody is taking care of themselves, and the weakest members of humanity, which are really billions of people, are being left behind. Is, the crisis, is this COVID crisis accelerating a return to the nation state? Well, certainly COVID is a digital accelerator. We um, deliver digital services in weeks. We hadn't been able to do it for decades. Uh, and uh, obviously we had put a lot of work in, in, in transforming the state. And I see uh, the digital revolution as the only way to break through you know, traditional bureaucratic silos. And we've been able to start initiating this um, uh, sort of uh, state um, re-engineering process by using digital tools. And it is very much appreciated by citizens. Again, very non-ideological approach, really appealing to the, uh, to the young, fighting a bureaucracy that has held Greece back for, um, for ages. This, I would argue, is, is almost an opportunity for us to, to, to leapfrog uh, other countries uh, because we're doing it in, in, such a, um, in such a dramatic fashion and the impact can be so uh, significant. So certainly the crisis is an accelerator. Uh, is it uh, a return to the nation state? Yes, yes and no. There were also um, periods during the pandemic where every state was clearly out there on its own. I remember very well the first phase of the pandemic where we were all scrambling to find you know, protective gear. Mm. There was no European solidarity at the time. It did take us some, some time to, um, uh, to get to that uh, point. But I would, I would certainly agree with you that if we want a global plan, we need the US engaged. Um, and we probably also need China engaged at some point. It, it can't just happen without the two largest economies being engaged. The same is also true for climate change, um, uh, which is probably the biggest existential challenge um, uh, we, uh, we are facing. Uh, on your comments regarding jobs, which I think is uh, uh, absolutely um, uh, spot on, uh, the biggest challenge that we face as, you know, as, as, as policy makers is how do you put in place um, proper uh, you know, skills-based retraining programs that are actually appealing, and how do you explain to people where the jobs will be, uh, not in the distant future, but in the near future. And how do we also explain to people that you know, a traditional university degree from a Greek public university may not necessarily be the way to earn a good living? Um, we're currently tabling a piece of legislation where we are completely rethinking uh, our technical education. You know, um, uh, maybe plumbers or, or electricians may not be outsourced to robots before other um, 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 uh, jobs are. And we face in Greece a big shortage of technically skilled people. And, and you know, sometimes we're also talking about jobs which may come from the past. Traditional craftsmanship is making a resurgence because there's more demand um, uh, for it. Yet I don't see much uh, interest in many you know, areas in, in Greece for these types of jobs, which actually could be very well, um, uh, very good paying jobs and also help um, regional development. So thinking you know, 5, 10, 15 years ahead and making sure you make the changes now in your educational system uh, is a challenge. You know, I constantly use the example that a kid that starts uh, elementary school today will graduate in 20, from high school in 2032 and from university if we still have four-year university curricula then in 2036. But what sorts of skills are we giving our younger kids um, today to prepare for that world? So this is a, a difficult question. What is certain is that the EU has a lot of funding available for these types of programs, but then we also need to convince people that uh, it's in their interest to get this type of, um, uh, of training. It's not just us um, offering, let's say, an economic incentive for people to retrain. 
uh, that may not be enough on its own if people don't understand that, it, that you, the, the concept of getting an education, getting a job, and getting a pension may no longer, it is probably uh, already uh, being, uh, it's, it's probably already uh, obsolete. So we learn uh, all the time, we'll change jobs uh, probably more frequently. Um, uh, you know, we've raised our retirement age. Uh, one good thing with the crisis in Greece is that we have already made difficult reforms that other European countries haven't even, you know, contemplated uh, uh, yet. Uh, and of course, one last point, um, uh, you know, regarding what we learned from COVID. Um, if you can, uh, uh, um, if you can not, not just live but work from anywhere, wouldn't you prefer to work from here? Um, uh, from Greece, uh, from a Greek island, if you have, you know, connectivity, safety, to you know, Greece, good, uh, good health care. It, it's not just a pitch to come to Greece, yeah. it's a pitch of why Greece right. has a significant comparative advantage yeah. because in this new and changing world, aspects such as, you know, quality of life become that much more, uh, that much more uh, important. So there will be winners and losers. There won't just be losers as a result of yeah. the COVID disruption. <laughs> and, you know, my job is to make sure that, you know, we're... Uh, medium-sized country, of course, we, we, we want to contribute to the global dialogue, but you know, my responsibility as the Prime Minister of Greece is to make sure that we're on the side of those who come out stronger after COVID. Can we, can we circle, I'm sorry, did you please one make a point? question? I mean, yeah. just about this, this point of say, I don't know, accountants from Sweden coming to work from Mykonos or Crete, uh, because the infrastructure is here, and even in university, I mean, if you teach on, on Zoom, you can teach in Harvard, but instead of being in Boston during the winter, you can be in Greece. Uh, why not? But then this raises the question of the uh, digital infrastructure. Who owns it? I mean, as more and more of the economy and our social and private life yeah. shifts to the digital infrastructure, then isn't it time to make it a public good? And what kind of world is it when our entire lives are being conducted on platforms owned by private businesses and individuals, maybe on the other side of the world, that they have their finger on the switch that controls our entire life. They also have access to all the data. Now, you mentioned the efforts of the EU to regulate data privacy. But the issue is that Europe, I mean, there is an, now a, a digital cold war between China and the US. Europe doesn't have any horse in the race. I mean, none of the big tech companies is European. So that's a huge, huge problem for uh, Europe if it wants to really influence what's going on. Uh, to again, give the worst case scenario, uh, Greece has in its history had to deal with a lot of empires and foreign conquests. Now there is a new form of imperialism, and kind of digital imperialism to dominate a country today, you don't need to send in the tanks, you just need to take out the data. If you imagine, say, Greek politics in 20 years, when the entire personal records of every politician, every mayor, every journalist is held by somebody in Beijing or San Francisco or Moscow, you know, when you were a kid, you did not have a Facebook account. But think about the politician in 20 years that she or he are running for office and somebody has the entire record of what they did in college. Nobody can serve, no politician, the reputation of no politician can survive such a thing. You think of everything you've done in high school, in college, is in the hands of somebody. Yeah. Well, I would argue, first of all, just to start from your last point, that this level of, uh, um, of transparency, there's a thin line between uh, transparency, and, um, which we all aspire to, and breach of breach of privacy. Uh, and for us politicians, it's very, very difficult to draw that line. Uh, but we assume that we live in a glass house and that everything we do uh, is, um, uh, is completely public. And frankly, one of the reasons why many capable people don't want to get involved in politics is exactly because they don't want to go through this. Uh, and I, I know exactly from experience how painful it can be for myself or my family uh, to have to go through you know, that exposure. That is a big challenge that we will face in terms of, uh, it's a global challenge in terms of attracting talented people um, to, to the cause of public service. Uh, now, in terms of digital, who owns the data and who owns the digital infrastructure, 
Look, Europe has taken um, uh, important steps in terms of defining, you know, critical digital infrastructure that it would like, and I think rightly so, um, to have uh, w within, you know, European ownership. Uh, but we need to be honest. Uh, if that means that maybe some of the services will have to be more expensive, mm -hmm. um, um, this is a trade-off we probably need to to explain and be willing to uh, and, and be willing to uh, to accept. Uh, when you look at how do you think about new technologies, we've just um, starting the will be will be one of the first countries to auction off our 5G um, uh, spectrum. We've taken chunk of the proceeds, uh, and rather than putting them um, in the budget. Uh, we've created a new um, uh, uh, a new fund that will support uh, you know 5G ecosystem uh, uh, in uh, in Greece. So we're trying to, you know, within again the capacity of a medium-sized European country, um, uh, to to play our own role in terms of developing um, uh, technology. But you're right to point out that we need more sort of European champions well, if I may, uh, in this if game. Well, I may jump in here because the issue that both of you are raising uh, is, is one that actually has come up a lot during this conference, the much bigger issue and concern about uh, digital democracy and also digital dictatorship, the dangers of digital dictatorship. You, Prime Minister, talked about how, for example, uh, th this country deleted uh, data uh, on the app, on the, on the tracing app. There's a much bigger concern that we're getting in comments even right now from viewers um, as you both speak about, you know, how do we, uh, the, uh, how do we sort of uh, deal with sort of the dark side of technology, what we've been seeing on social media, the use of social media as platforms for digital manipulation, for political manipulation. Um, you know, is this going to get worse before it gets better? How are we going to regulate that, especially at a time when, as you've all, you've pointed out, everybody is willingly giving themselves over to a type of a certain type of monitoring now in the name of uh, in the name of health in the name of the greater good what's to prevent that from actually being turned against people in some ways by by their own leaders mm -hmm. um, I'll, uh, first of all the tech companies themselves have have work to do it's it's, it's, it's very very clear uh, and the boundaries are not always very um, uh, very clear but uh, you know if uh, for example Facebook has a policy of taking down pages that uh, spread uh, uh, hatred or systematic misinformation they have a, they are the aggregator uh, at the end of the day and if they don't do it somebody else is going to do it um, 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 for them there's there's no uh, uh, doubt uh, about that now democracy is um, you know is adjusting and uh, and again uh, new uh, new media offer an, an opportunity for politicians to, um, uh, I'd say, disseminate their message. And there's also, there is also a, an, an interesting element uh, in that you no longer need, uh, which is not good for your job, but um, you don't no longer need an integrator or an aggregator or an editor. It may be problematic because all the news that's fit to print, which is what the New York Times motto is, means that there is someone who, who places a framework uh, uh, and is editing it. On the other hand, yeah. it also gives the opportunity for someone to communicate um, uh, directly and gives an, uh, and if you, um, if you say something interesting, um, people will listen to you or if you say something inflammatory, people will listen to you. So um, we have to recognize that human nature has, has, has two aspects. There's always a dark side um, uh, to it uh, and social media can be a force for good or it can be a force for bad. I don't have an obvious answer on how uh, on, on how you regulate it, short of uh, imposing total control and becoming, which is not obviously what I advocate, which is what some countries do, and, and having full state control uh, uh, over uh, what happens, uh, when it happens, and what people uh, listen to. That is not an option for um, uh, for Western uh, uh, for Western um, uh, democracies. But it is very clear that at some point you need a, a filter, and it's either going to be at the level of the uh, of the big uh, um, tech companies, or it's going to be probably at, at a higher level. Maybe both would have to take place at the same time. Mm -hmm. well, I think the key issue is the emerging ability to hack human beings, which was never the case before in history. There is a lot of talk about hacking computers and smartphones and bank accounts, but the really big revolution we are living through is the emerging ability to hack people, to collect enough, if you have enough data on a person and you have enough computing power, you can hack that person 
you can understand them better than they understand themselves. You can know their political views, their sexual preferences, their personality, even better than they, and then you can completely manipulate them. And this is something that democracy or frankly any other human society never had to deal with before. It was impossible uh, throughout history. And this really undermines our traditional ideas about democracy and open society. But democracy assumes free will from the individuals that we ultimately, nobody can manipulate us beyond a certain point. And it's the same with the free economy, that you know the customer is always right. In the end, corporations say customers have free will. But once corporations and governments have the ability to hack humans, then there is no longer free will. They know how to manipulate me. And we're seeing it happening now on a small scale, but increasingly on a big scale. And you know, you have the smartest people in the world coming out of Harvard and MIT and Stanford over the last 10 years, working on the problem of how to make you click on ads. And they succeeded because they hacked our brains. They discovered that the easiest way to uh, grab your attention is to press the hate button, the fear button, the anger button in your brain. When they discover what you already fear or what you already hate, and they show you maybe a fake news story about that, and you have an irresistible urge to click on it. What, what did he say this time? What did he do this time? It's really more powerful than you are. And, and this is a game changer. We are still working with the ideological and philosophical ideas of Plato and Aristotle and Kant and the Enlightenment thinkers, but they did not have to deal with uh, an, uh, machine learning systems that can hack human beings. So I think we really need, I have a deep faith in the ability of democracy to reinvent itself. The advantage of democracy over dictatorships and all other systems is that it is democratic governments are more willing to acknowledge their own shortcomings and mistakes or if nothing helps, then they can just be replaced by another government. So democracies are more adaptable. But we have to be very clear about the nature of the threat uh, we are facing. And really, I, I think we need to, first of all, acknowledge the weakness of human beings. The easiest people to manipulate are those who believe in complete free will that anything I choose is my own, I do it for my own freedom. Realizing that no, you now live in a world where there are outside systems that can hack you uh, is the first step towards building a more resilient uh, democratic system. Yeah, um, two points. First of all, on the value of, of classical um, uh, philosophy, I would argue that uh, the thinkers of the past were very good at, first of all, trying to, to interpret a world they could not understand. And that's what made them, you know, extremely powerful. Uh, and it's the sort of same thought process that we need to, 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 to go through now. There are aspects, there are questions. We ask questions, which we don't know the answer to, but we're forced to come up with some answer because these are extremely um, relevant questions. Um, to the, the, the issue of... Uh, data manipulation, it is already happening to, I mean, all the, the big tech companies are making a lot of money by, by using data which we consciously, or maybe unconsciously provide them with, uh, and, and making sure they, they offer us what they think is of interest to us. Mm -hmm. So they, um, uh, uh, and it is, uh, you know, I, I remember that, you know, this, I don't know, remember who the CEO was, but it was the CEO of a big consumer goods company in, you know, in the 60s who said, I know that 50% of my advertisement um, uh, is, is money well spent. I just don't know what 50%. Well, now we know. Yes. Um, uh, and, that is, and that, of course, is, uh, is, uh, is data that can also be used. It can be used by private companies, but it can also be used by the state. And if the state is, uh, first of all, has the obligation to make... Um, uh, data available publicly 
I'm a big believer in, uh, in open data to the extent that it is non-personalized uh, uh, because that data can be a force for good because there's lots of, of technologies that are also being developed. We talk about AI and let's say, and you've written on this, uh, and about autonomous driving. Uh, and yes, it may destroy jobs, but it will also save, you know, more than a million people die every year. Yeah. Um, 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 so we talk about, you know, COVID is an opportunity to talk about the value of human life above all. Well, let's think also uh, about that, um, uh, about that angle. Last point you raised about the, the, you know, democracy. I think democracy can self-correct. Uh, we saw that in Greece after 10 years of populism. Um, we have a government now that is, I would term a liberal, moderate, reform-oriented government that wants to make you know, big changes and that enjoys a great degree of public support. Would that have been possible five years ago? I don't know. Honestly, I don't, I don't know. But after 10 years of crisis uh, and experimenting with populists, uh, in, in our case on the left, Greek society was ready and through an open democratic process chose to place her face in us and in three years, we will again go to the polls, and you know, if they like us, they will probably vote for us again. If if not, they will choose something else. And that is the beauty uh, of democracy and its ability um, uh, to to self uh, correct. And we should not forget that we've also gone through. Uh, look at the history of other crises. Look at the 30s uh, in the U.S. Uh, and how leaders came up with extremely bold responses. These were democratic responses, but they also had a significant level of public support. Because at the end of the day, no democracy, no matter how, how strong it is, can impose big changes by simply referring to an electoral mandate. Because at some point they need to implement policies, and when they implement policies, they need to have enough people on board uh, to at least uh, give them the benefit of the doubt that the policies move in the right direction. So it, it sounds like the both of you do have faith that democracy and democratic systems will overcome these challenges. At the same time, for example, I'm getting a lot of questions from our viewers on, once again, this issue of the, the, the rise of, of autocratic regimes, however, around the world. Mm -hmm. And again, the role that, that technology is playing in sort of, you know, uh, telegraphing that message in a sort of an exponential way. People are interested in knowing, you know, is the world going to basically turn more autocratic in the coming years, perhaps partly because of the major uh, opening that um, the coronavirus is, is providing? Are we going to see a kind of almost um, a clash of civilizations emerging? Um, I don't know. It depends on the decisions that people around the world take in the coming months and years. History is not deterministic. Uh, we still have agency, we still have the power to, to decide such things. The danger is that once you go autocratic, there is no way back. I mean, again, the big advantage of a democracy, yes, democracies sometimes are more slow because it's not about convincing one person. You need compromise, you need to convince a lot of people. But if they make a mistake, then it's much more easy to acknowledge it and try something else. With an autocratic regime, uh, whenever they make a mistake, they just can blame others, demand even more power for themselves. And once the authoritarian regime is, is in power, it's in, under modern condition, it's extremely difficult to shake it off from within. If you look at truly totalitarian regimes, like Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, they could not, no matter how bad they were, it was impossible to overthrow them from within. They could be overthrown only from above, like in the Soviet Union, when the leadership itself decided that it's time to try something else, or from outside, like in the case of Nazi Germany, but not from within. And this is, you know, it's kind of, uh, once, you, once people make the choice, oh, let's try an authoritarian regime, it's not let's try, it's for life in many cases. So it's an extremely dangerous path to go. And unfortunately, there are many countries now on, on the verge of, of making this dangerous choice. I think the big challenge will be reinventing the state within the democratic context. Because the pandemic has proven that the state is important, and especially in times of crisis, has a big role to play. And it cannot be replaced either by uh, you know, individual free will or by the markets. That, I think, was, uh, was a very clear lesson um, uh, of, the, um, uh, uh, of the pandemic. And I think that uh, there are clearly competing visions of how to organize societies. 
Uh, and uh, one should, and I'm speaking from the perspective of, uh, of a democratic leader, uh, at, we have an obligation to at least look at what's happening um, uh, uh, in the East. First of all, the first thing that we see, uh, and I think Eastern societies, and I'm talking about democratic societies in the East, have been much better uh, at imposing uh, what we call social discipline. Mm -hmm. And there's a question to be asked, why is this happening? Um, uh, what is their set of priorities? What is their set of values? Why do they value maybe human life? And what do you call uh, free will discipline? I'm very, try to be very careful in, what I, in, 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 in my terminology over the right to party, for example. Um, and they've been more successful. Um, we should be very, 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 uh, very honest with that. There are also aspects of, of good governance that are interesting. Uh, do we have, this is going to be provocative, I mean, this is a question I'm raising, but it's provocative. If S Singapore pays its civil servants, but also its ministers, very, very high salaries that are competitive with the private sector, um, is there, um, could this ever happen um, in, um, uh, in the West? If it doesn't happen, and I'm not sure it will happen, then you need a different calling for public service. Um, people, as it has happened in the past, people enter public service not because they were well paid, but because there was a sense of, uh, of, of greater good that was, uh, that, that was being served. But if there's one thing which is, which, which is a given, is that we cannot, as a state, we have to be competitive vis-a-vis -vis the private sector in terms of how we use technology. Um, uh, we cannot outsource technological progress to the private sector, uh, uh, and it will happen if all the smart people end up working um, for Silicon Valley uh, rather than working for uh, for the government. Let me, we're just about to run out of time here. Let me ask you, Mr. Prime Minister, do you have a question for Yuval? <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I actually asked him what is his uh, what is his uh, what is his next book, um, uh, yeah. and, and how do you how do you communicate? very complex uh, uh, ideas uh, uh, in, in a simple way, which I think he's, well, he's very good at. Uh, and he actually told me that he's writing a... You know, yeah, we are uh, now just yeah. about to publish a graphic novel, a comic book for adults, uh, which again tells the history of the world uh, in a very different way. It was fun to, fun to write it. I mean, I think it's the most fun thing I've ever done. It's, I didn't draw myself. I draw like a five-year-old kid. I teamed up <laughs> with uh, experts, with artists in Belgium and, and, and France. And it's, it's just coming out. And the, the idea is, you know, to bridge the gap between the scientific community and the general public to provide people with the latest findings of science, but in a fun, engaging way, uh, with comics, with fictional characters. So um, I hope it's good. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I'm a big believer in the value of history. Uh, yeah. And uh, if you want to read one text, if one wants to read one text which is relevant given the context, you know, revisit Pericles' funeral oration, which was written at a time when democratic Athens was struck um, by a plague. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's a magnificent um, uh, eulogy to the mm. power uh, of democracy uh, mm. in, a, you know, in a time of crisis. Well, that is an ex excellent advice and uh, the perfect note for us to wrap up on. Thank you both very much for being here for sort of sharing your views. Um, there was a lot of, there was some, you know, desperation, some, a lot of worry, you know, that uh, has been coming up uh, during this extraordinary period, but the both of you um, have also given a lot of hope and hopefully a way forward. So thank you very much once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.